Hey, how you doing? I hope you're doing well. Happy New Year. Sunday, December 25th. So I'm sitting in the middle of the bathroom floor, lying on a shitty Walmart rug that I regret buying, and I'm scrubbing the grime that never seems to wash away, the tiny speckle of dirt that nobody can see but you. The dirt looks back at me and me at it. I think we are starting to have an understanding. But then, my two brain cells left from the constant alcohol abuse, existential stress, and the immense pressure of making a Jason Todd fan film, those two brain cells start spinning, round and round, chatting. You know what would be cool? If Alex talked about Matt Reeves the Batman, or made a video that isn't about cape shit or fucking retired? No. If he talked about what he wanted from... Yo, I'm not one to do these kind of videos, but here we are. Obviously, whatever ideas I have are probably going to be so far off base from what Matt Reeves, that genius, has in store. Obviously, this is all for fun. Obviously, I want to hear what you want from the Batman 2. Seriously, tell me your fan fiction in the comments while you listen to mine. Thank you. Fade in. A first-person point of view. We are breathing with someone, blinking with someone. We are waking up. We look in the mirror and see we are Bruce Wayne. And we're looking pretty rough. We've barely slept, eaten, half in our costume still. We move our way through Wayne Tower, our home. It would be a stretch to call it that. A bunch of papers are spread out everywhere, on our table, on the ground, business papers. Things we have to sign off on. We sit down to sort through the papers, carelessly skimming them. We look out the window into the Gotham sky. Our signal. We are needed. Cut to the title card. The Batman Heart of Ice. We now mimic the iconic opening to the Batman, but instead of torturing the guilty with brutality and fear, Bruce is helping the victims. We hear through his voiceover how long it's been, how Gotham is still recovering from the Riddler's attack, how now more than ever people are looking for hope. Those stuck in their flooded apartments, the homeless who are drenched in Gotham's filth, he's helping everyone he can, it's inspiring. Batman's still got a few screws loose, he still has no idea how to be touched, how to be comforting, how to be comforted, but he's trying. He has become the creature of the night, the demon who protects life emerging from the shadowed hells of Gotham to help those who pray, who long for someone who cares. Batman cares. And Bruce? Bruce feels so guilt-ridden for inspiring Riddler, for bringing Alfred harm, for indirectly causing Gotham's pain, that he's overcompensating. He's not sleeping at all. He's never home unless it's to check on Alfred. He barely even goes back to the cave anymore. Instead, he hangs out in a small clock tower located in the worst part of Gotham City. He's turned it into a mini base of operations. He calls it the Belfry. If you thought the Batcave from the first movie was a bleak, dimly lit work in progress, this is 10 times more depressing. It's a bunch of tied together computer monitors and radios with a single chair in the center. The only element of a personal touch is a photo of Selina he has but even that's a tad creepy. Police chatter is constantly playing, blasting in his ear. Bruce has planted security cameras, hidden cameras all over Gotham, at the orphanage, at Wayne Tower, at the GCPD. He has Alfred bugged Gordon's home under constant watch. He feels so responsible for everything that happened, for what Falcone did, for what Edward did, for what his father did. He knows the Batman can no longer be vengeance. He needs to be hope. But his idea of becoming hope, of becoming more, has maybe gone too far. People need to know someone is out there for them, and he's taken that to an absurd degree. Batman exists to make sure no little boy ever has to live with the pain he does. Batman has to be there for that child. Batman has to be there for his people all the time. But Bruce Wayne? Bruce still remains completely absent. 
Alfred is pushing him to meet with Bella Real, take more interest in his company, and making a difference through his philanthropy. The public, some of them at least, are behind Bruce Wayne. They're in support. They saw what he did, how he saved an orphan boy. Instead of being angry with Alfred for suggesting he takes off the cowl and take a damn shower, Bruce at least hears him out. He's growing. He's more mature here. His arrogance and disinterest is far less prevalent here. He musters up the courage to do it, to meet with the new mayor, to be Bruce Wayne. We get a scene of him practicing faces in the mirror, mimicking liked politicians, mimicking socialization. It's a bit intense, but he's trying. That's what matters. He's trying. He heads to the meeting, which is at Wayne Enterprises, not Wayne Tower. It's kind of confusing because in the Reeves verse, Bruce lives in Wayne Tower, but I doubt his employees and company are run from that building. Point is, it's a different building, one across town. Bruce is nervous. It's charming to see him be so nervous, so not collected. Alfred comforts him on the phone. Think of it as a very messed up version of a boy going on his first date. He gets to Wayne Enterprises, which is huge, filled to the brim with people. They all stop as soon as Bruce walks in. To be honest, I don't think Bruce has ever set foot in here, and neither have we. We get a layout of the building as Bruce awkwardly makes his way up to the meeting room. It's a mix of dark deco and Blade Runner's retro futurism. Bruce is either being way too extroverted and off-putting, or completely dead silent depending on who is speaking to him. He's perfected Batman, but billionaire Bruce Wayne continues to be a mess. He arrives, Jim is there, Bella is there, and Bella immediately starts introducing Bruce to everyone. She's stressed, but thrilled he has agreed to this. Bruce shakes hands with Gordon, some other politicians, policemen, board members. It's a frantic blur until Jim wants Bruce to meet the new district attorney. Harvey is everything Bruce needs to be in the eyes of the public. Handsome, charming, caring, a radical who wants to bring in real change. He grew up a lot like Edward Nashton, orphaned, abandoned, left to rot. He turned his pain into a desire for change, and he wants to create that change within the system instead of outside it. Within their interaction, Bruce starts mimicking him slightly, his tone of voice, his cadence, his posture, and Harvey catches on, but also Harvey is the only one in this room that cares enough to empathize with Bruce. He knows his history, he knows he's a recluse. Harvey tries to make him laugh, make him smile, it's genuine, sweet, sincere. He wants Bruce to fund orphanages, childcare, he wants to offer drop addicts a safe place to get clean, he mentions this circus show he wants to to bring to town to raise money for at-risk youth. He's so passionate that it's infectious. We hang on his every word. Hell, he's even making us emo boys smile. Harvey is giving us hope. And Bruce is seeing that, seeing that it's possible to do that without a mask, without a symbol to hide behind. It's going so, so well. Bam, an explosion, a horrendous jump scare that rattles us. We move back into the point of view shot. We are Bruce again. We stagger around the room trying to make sure everyone is alive. Gordon has Bella. He is screaming for help. We lift some rubble from Harvey. His leg is busted. What just happened? There's broken glass everywhere, but no smoke. We aren't on fire. Nothing is. We start seeing our breath. That's not broken glass. That's ice. I've always wanted, no, needed, needed to see Mr. Freeze be given his due on the big screen. What Paul Dini did with his character, how he took a cold gun ice spewing meme and turned him into a complex tortured soul was groundbreaking. And what Mr. Freeze could do for this Batman, this Bruce Wayne has the same powerful moving potential. For most of Act 2, we are with Bruce Wayne. Most of the Batman 1 took place in the costume. I want this movie to take Bruce. No, force him out of it. Bruce wishes so deeply that he had the suit, his wall of armor between himself and the world, but he has no way to get to his cave or his clock tower. 
Bruce is forced to move throughout Wayne Enterprises and all of its floors. He's forced to do so in the company of a broken-legged Harvey Dent. Here, we see how little we and Bruce know about his corporation. He doesn't know a single employee. He doesn't even really know what they do there. Here, we get to truly know Harvey and further understand Bruce. Turns out him and Harvey have a lot in common, other than being orphans. Harvey's obsessive, his whole political charm was learned. He taught himself in the mirror how to be someone that the public would listen to. He created a persona that could be liked, could be loved. It's what he had to do. The real Harvey is somewhere underneath all that. The real Harvey is deeply hurt by his experiences. The real Harvey is angry for the pain caused by Gotham's apathy. We and Bruce see a glimmer of that, just as Harvey sees a faint shadow of the real Bruce. We haven't really seen Bruce talk a lot about his life outside the mission. His backstory is so vague and I love that. But here, he cannot talk about Batman. He cannot talk about the Gotham experiment. He has to talk about himself. He's forced to. How did he spend his life after the death of his parents? Did he train the entire time? Did he go to school? Was everything taught by Alfred? We don't get the whole picture. We get the fractured pieces of the truth told to Harvey. We see the other employees, his employees, scared, terrified, trying to figure out what the hell is going on. As we descend the building back towards the entrance, it's getting colder and colder. Frozen windows become frozen elevators down and down back to the lobby. It's blocked off, frozen shut. They must keep moving down. Underneath Wayne Enterprises is Wayne Labs, the research labs. Frozen stairs lead us to an array of frozen bodies, not pristinely kept in a block of ice, but cut up, torn by the elements. Their skin is purple, it's peeling off, it's terrifying, it's a horror film. Bruce and Harvey try to do what they can, save who they can, but without the Batman, it's nearly impossible. They reach the source. Bruce thinks it's an attack, some kind of chemical bomb. Gotham is weak, ready for the taking. Is this the power grab that was bound to happen? But no. The trail of frozen bodies lead us to one. One man. Dr. Victor Freeze. He's a scientist, a younger one, older than Bruce and Harvey, but not by much. He's a scientist in a sleek, self-made protection suit. A hazmat suit to shield himself from the cold. In this more grounded Reeves universe, he's not a metahuman, not yet at least. He doesn't need the cold to survive. He needs his suit to complete his mission, much like Batman needs his. Freeze looks past Harvey and right at Bruce. He says nothing. He doesn't smile. No evil villain speech or twitch stream. He just stares at Bruce, the same kind of stare Batman often gives. Hidden underneath Freeze's helmet, within the stare, are his tears. Harvey pressures Bruce to run, but Bruce is locked in on Freeze. Freeze says something, a single word, Nora. He aims a large gun tied to his suit, his freeze gun, right at Bruce. Harvey yanks Bruce out of the way. Bam! The GCPD SWAT managed to burst open an exit out of the labs. Bruce pulls Harvey closely, carrying him. As they are rushing out, being escorted out by screaming officers, Bruce keeps turning back. The SWAT team is being frozen, not in a sterile, cool, comic book, block of ice kind of way, but being hit with an immediate wave of frostbite. Their limbs are falling off in an instant as they try to stop Freeze. Bruce wants to help, but he can't. Too many eyes, too hectic, that's what he's telling himself. Outside, it's beginning to snow. Reporters want to know what's happening. Gordon wants to talk to Bruce. Bella is addressing the public. But Bruce bails. He dips back to the clock tower, his belfry, checking his hidden cameras all throughout Gotham. 
Wayne-funded projects are being frozen, airports, research labs, banks, hospitals, coordinated attacks. Liquid nitrogen bombs exploding, turning the structures, the air around them into absolute zero. Gotham's endless downpour of rain has turned into a blinding white blizzard. The floods have turned into ice rinks. Something, someone is emerging from Wayne Enterprises. The camera zooms in on him. Bruce watches. Victor addresses the public calmly, sadly, tragically. My name is Dr. Victor Freeze. I do not wish to harm. I have taken the lives of 23 Wayne Enterprises employees and 10 Gotham City policemen. They had families, loved ones. Victor is crying now. I do not wish to take any more life. I only ask for one more. Then I will turn myself in. Bruce Wayne. Bruce Wayne killed my wife, my Nora. We see footage Victor is showing us, Bruce and all of Gotham footage. It's a home movie. Victor has been documenting his research, his life, his love. A scientist, a good man, his beautiful, brilliant wife, Nora. So warm, full of love, they were partners not only in marriage but in their research. Victor was so close to finding a cure for Huntington's disease, so close to unlocking possible cures, treatments for Alzheimer's disease, dementia. Nora's brain was deteriorating. She was forgetting him, forgetting how to move, how to breathe right in front of him. He worked for Wayne Enterprises for over a decade. He begged for more funding, for more time. He spoke to every possible person, all he needed, all he really needed in order to save his wife, to make the next big breakthrough in medical science, was a signature, one signature. One phone call. One Bruce Wayne. Freeze will be waiting at the top of Wayne Enterprises. He wants the public to deliver Bruce Wayne and he will end this. He will turn himself in. Following in the footsteps of the Riddler, Mr. Freeze has made his statement. This time, it's not about the sins of the father, but the careless apathy Bruce has shown his people. Bruce Wayne is careless. Bruce Wayne does not bring hope. He kills it. Bruce Wayne has a heart of ice. In the Belfry, Bruce is seeing all of this, and he's wrecked by it. Along with Bruce, we remember our first scene. Waking up. The pile of documents that went unseen skim through a woman's life, the 23 lives of his employees, the endless lives that could have been saved by Victor's research. All because the signal was, will be, is more important than that stack of papers. Bruce looks at his costume, a new one, a prototype, Mark II of the bat suit, and then he looks in the mirror. Of course he will stop Victor, because he's the Batman. But maybe, and I would so very much love to see this play out, maybe Batman isn't the one who can inspire hope this time. Maybe Batman cannot save this life. Maybe Bruce Wayne is the only hope, but Bruce Wayne doesn't even know who Bruce Wayne is. That's the climax in my head, the perfect one, the most challenging thing this Batman has done yet. Instead of fighting, using his training, his arsenal, his fear to beat Mr. Freeze, Batman has to do something that is truly terrifying to him, that he has no idea how to do. Batman has to take off the mask and speak to, not beat, Victor. Bruce Wayne has to try to save Victor Freeze. And that's my hope, what I would love to see for the Batman 2. 
I love when sequels follow a similar plot as the first film, but enrich the characters. I always love when sequels go smaller in scale, but far grander in emotional weight. I love the idea of a large portion of this film being locked into Wayne Enterprises. If the Batman 1 challenged our ideas of what Batman is, I want the Batman 2 to challenge the idea of who Bruce Wayne is. Will the actual film be anything like this? Probably not. But if you like some of my silly ideas, you can watch our original Jason Todd fan film, which should come out sometime this year. How would I tease future installments in the Batman franchise? Well, you know those security cameras that Bruce has all over the city? The pure invasion of privacy he has created for his idea of protection? Well, I would end the film after the emotional battle with Freeze is finished by going into another POV, another voyeur watching those cameras. This franchise is all about the voyeurs, those who watch but feel they cannot live. Someone has hacked into those cameras, and someone has access to all the information, the secrets that Batman does. Someone who only utters one single whisper as an owl swoops past us. Hush. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching the video and thank you to Loverboy Media for editing this massive undertaking. Uh, did you guys like this? Did you guys like the style of like fan fiction uh, stuff? I, I had fun doing it. I had a lot of fun. Um, I hope everyone had a lovely holiday. Uh, sorry for the lack of content recently. I've been so fucking busy making the Jason movie, but I think it's going to be something really special. But thank you so much for your lovely, 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 lovely support that you've shown me and have a nice day.